invite you to pray with me. Um, as you can probably tell from my voice, last week's cough went into this week, and so uh, my voice is a little bit strained. But So I ask for your prayers for me, because I believe God has a word for us uh, out of his word this morning. And um, even if I'm not feeling 100%, God is more than 100%. And so I'm asking him to take uh, a strained voice like mine and I probably will perspire a bit, but I'm here. Let's let God do his thing. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray with me. Father in heaven, God, you promise that in our weakness, you'll make us strong. No matter what we're facing, Lord, that you will carry us through it, uh, that you never leave us nor you never forsake us, God, that you are a faithful God. And God, your word and your promises are faithful. And so, God, you have a word for us this morning. So we ask, God, that you would teach us now from your word that you would give me strength, give me clarity, give us all uh, an alert heart and mind and a receptive uh, receptive heart and mind to what you want to give to us this morning. Lord, we all need your grace. God, thank you that you give us one another. And as we seek to love one another, God, as you have loved us, that we can receive and share your grace. Um, Your grace which brings life to dead places, your grace which brings... um, us through and moves us forward one moment, one day at a time. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are continuing this morning in our sermon series called When God's People Love One Another. And uh, as we've been reflecting as we move towards Easter, what does it mean for us as a church family, as followers of Christ? And if you're here investigating the church or investigating God, glad that you're here, that you would get a picture of of the church, of what it truly means for the family of God, the new family of Jesus, to love one another. And so in this series, we're going through a a set of commands in the New Testament that are framed in the words, one another. Uh, The mutuality commands of things such as, like last week, we consider what it means to accept or welcome one another. We consider what it means to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to forgive one another. And this morning's focus, we're going to consider what it means to be real with one another. But all this needs to be rooted in love. And Jesus' words, his, some of his final words to his disciples before he went to the cross and was crucified, he taught them these, these, this great word out of John 13, 34 through 35. I invite you to read it with me. Read this with me. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. Right, here's Jesus again saying, love one another. Right, love is more than a feeling. We can, it's more than just feeling love for another person. It's, it takes the form of action. Right? And Jesus exhorts us. He commands us. He instructs us to, to love one another. To put it into action like he has loved us. And, and he has loved us with a, love, a sacrificial love. And all true love, true love requires sacrifice. Sacrifice for the sake of the other person. Sacrifice for the sake of relationship. And we ultimately, we see that in Jesus. And so to do that this morning, we're going to consider what it means to be real with one another. Right? In a world where a lot of us, including, I know I major and do really well in image management. Right? Putting on a mask, saying everything's fine, everything's good. But in a world where we are all struggling. We all have different struggles that are happening. And here in the church where it should be the safest place for us to take off our mask and to be real with one another. Sadly, over the course of church history, the church has become one of the least safe places to do that. Because sadly, at least from my vantage point, I've seen that more and more that we feel like we have to bring our best selves always to church. That we can't let anyone know, wait, I'm struggling. And if we let others know we're struggling, will we be judged? Will we be accepted? Will we experience love? But the good news of Scripture is that, as Charlene said before, that God's grace is for us. And God does love us. And if anywhere should be safe on planet Earth, it should be the church family. It should be a place where we can take off our masks, let down our guard, and be real with one another. This message is a very difficult one for me. It's very convicting for me. All week long as I've been praying through this, thinking this is something I struggle with. Uh, Because 
I don't like to mess up. I don't like to make mistakes. And granted, I could go into my, you know, into my childhood, my family of origin, and, and I've shared openly about in my growing up if the feeling of if I mess up, I'm going to hear about it. And I learned at a very early age, keep everything together. I learned at a very early age, achieve, get the right grades, be the Eagle Scout, make the varsity team, do everything right, and mom and dad will be quiet. That's what I remember learning as a kid. And all authority figures played out. I mean, my baseball coach, I mean, it was like hell on earth for me. Every time I messed up, he would just dig at me. I don't know why I stayed on the team. I should have quit. But he dialed up all of that shame and guilt in me and the other players. And so I know what it's like to, to try and look good. Even some this morning said, hey, how you doing, Jeff? I gave him a real answer. And he's like, I don't know. I didn't, that's not what I expected. Because <laughs> uh, I am struggling this morning. I'm struggling. Um, and I don't like to mess up. I don't like to look like I don't have it all together. Uh, because I know for me, the feeling of shame, the pain of shame, is something I try to avoid. I think that we all struggle with this at some level. Am I the only one? No. So I think we're in this together. And it goes back to all humanity. If you go back to the beginning of the Bible, you see when God comes looking for Adam and Eve after they took a bite of that forbidden fruit, and he says, where are you? And where are Adam and Eve? They're hiding. Full of shame. Hiding. They even had sewn fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Just trying to hide so they wouldn't have to feel that shame. It's been a part of human history. We all tend to hide. We all tend to put on masks. We all want to look like we have it together, especially here in the suburbs. But the good news is that God fully understands this, and he wants to help us. He wants to help you. He wants to help me. Right? And we see that in Scripture. We see it in multiple places. And, and what's typically been given as a description of all humanity in terms of pointing people to Christ is Romans 3.23. Right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? There's this bad news that none of us, none of you, not me, none of us have lived a perfect life. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Right? We've sinned by taking, looking at God's commands, God's law, and in some form or fashion by what we've done or failed to do. We've fallen short of God's perfection, his standard. And it seems like bad news. But hidden in that is good news. Hidden in that is the fact that we're all in this together. Or you can't look around the room and be like, wow, that person's perfect and I'm not. None of us are perfect. I've got some bad news for you this morning. We're all failures. Come on, man. That hurts, doesn't it? Let's, let's make it real. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a failure. Now turn back to the neighbor and say, I already knew that. Doesn't it feel good? It, it feels good in this culture where we're not supposed to fail, where we're not supposed to mess up. And in this graceless culture, if you mess up once, you're finished, asked to resign, and gone. We live in a graceless culture. But thank God that in Scripture we see a God who's not a graceless God. He's not only a God of second chances, he's a God of a million chances. He recognizes all of us, every one of his Dear children, has sinned and falls short of his glory. But he didn't leave us there. Before we talk about what it means to be real with one another, we have to remember the good news. And it's summarized wonderfully in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Let me read this to you. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Wow, there's some good news in these verses. Right? Recognize that we've all sinned that at the set time, at the perfect time, God sent his son, right? born of a woman, born under law, under law, the same law that none of us 
have been able to perfectly achieve. All of us have broken the law, God's law, and because we've broken the law, we deserved a penalty. But God paid that penalty. Jesus paid that penalty for you and for me on the cross. And he redeemed us. He bought us back. And for those who believe and trust this to be true, the promise of God is he gives us a new life. He receives us into his family, adopted as his child forever. And we see here not only that, but he gives us his spirit who goes into our hearts. And then that spirit testifies with our spirit that we're God's child. And we can cry out, Abba, Father. Abba, which means Daddy. It's this personal personal term for God. And because of that, we're also considered an heir. Right? This is the good news of the Bible, and it's the good news of Jesus Christ. And because of that, we could then consider what it means for us to be real with one another. Because if God saw that we're all sinners, and he knows that we're all failures, and didn't leave us there, but sent his son to buy us back, to bring us into his family, and it should on our better days, should give us freedom. Freedom to relate to God, freedom to relate with one another, right? To take off those masks that says everything's fine. God, I'm fine. No, I'm not. Others, hey, I'm fine. No, I'm not. Just take off that mask and to be real with one another. How this is described in one of the uh, one another's or each other's of scripture is James 5.16. This wonderful wisdom book found towards the back of the New Testament, where James says this that towards the end of that book from 5.16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. He says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Here, a way to be real with each other is to confess reality, to admit reality, to confess your sins to another person. Right, as we confess our sins to each other, and then he says, and we pray for each other, the promise is we will be healed. Right, what does it mean to confess? Confess means to agree with. Right, to, as you confess something, you agree that it's true. Right, you, you speak it. You name it. You say, this is real. You don't hide it. You bring it to light. All right, so he says, confess. Confess your sins to each other. Bring it to light. And that's one way we could be real with each other, recognizing that all of us have sinned. There's, there's no one who hasn't sinned. And so we should confess our sins to each other. How does this play out? Um, before we consider how we confess our sins to each other, it's considered just confession in general. Right? King David in Psalm 32 provides a, a telling description of this process of admitting and agreeing with the truth that we've, that we've sinned. Hear this prayer from David, King David in Psalm 32, starting in verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Listen to this description of before he confessed. He says this, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, he says, your hand was heavy on me, and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then, he says, he says, then, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. He says, therefore, let all of the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. And what a beautiful psalm. There's more to that psalm, but I'll stop there. And I mean, in the beginning, David calls out reality. He says, look, blessed are, blessed are, and, and are, are those whose, you know, whose transgressions are forgiven, this, whose sins are covered, whose, whose sin the Lord does not count against them. I mean, there's a sense of freedom, a sense of joy that comes when there's a recognition that God doesn't hold this against us. But David wasn't right there in the beginning. You see how David has, was holding back from confessing. And as he was holding back from his confessing, he says his bones were wasting away. He was groaning all day long. It was like having this massive weight on his shoulders, like a backpack.
having this on the, his back, this feeling of guilt, this feeling of shame, and he's carrying it. And it's sapping his energy like in the heat of summer. I picture David just walking along with this massive weight on him, this weight of, of, of sin, of how he's wronged God by how he's disregarded his commands. He's turned away from God, and, and he feels this weight. But then it changes, right? David says, Do I, I have this weight, but if I acknowledge this sin to God, if I seek forgiveness, if I confess or agree with God that indeed I have sinned, and confess that sin to God, the promise is that he'll take that, that burden off. Put it on the ground. And he could walk without that burden. And that's what you see from him. In fact, he, it's almost like he gets excited after he acknowledges that sin. And he says, therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. He's, he almost says, hey, everyone else, think about this. Go to, go to God. Confess. Agree with God that there's been sin. And let him give you that freedom. But that's between David and God. James takes it to another level. He then says, therefore, he says, confess your sins to each other and pray to each other. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. Why does he do that? Why do you think James, isn't it enough for us just to confess our sins to God? I mean, that's what David did. Why is James instructing us, his disciples then, and by us extension today, to confess our sins to each other? I believe there's power when we name reality with another person. Right? There's, it's one thing between us and God, but when you actually look at another person, make eye contact and share, and they receive that news, that there's power in that. There's something that God allows to happen when another brother and sister in Christ interacts with us and loves us in this way. When we both confess our sins and then someone receives that and points us to God. I believe that's another way that we can let go of that weight and we can move on. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. I think, I think this plays out in terms of confessing to God, but also to one another. You see that as we confess and renounce sins, we find mercy. That God's love and mercy comes to us. So what's this look like? How do we be real with one another? How do we confess our sins to each other? There's two roles involved, right? We've talked mostly about the one who confesses. Yeah, the, it takes a step for the person. There's one person who has to confess his or her sins to another person to say where they've fallen short of disobeyed God, turned away from God, and to admit, and to admit that that's happened. That's one role. The other role is the person who listens and then prays for the one who confesses. It's just as important that this other person is willing to listen, to provide a safe place for that sharing. And then, as we read in James, not only confess your sins to each other, but pray for one another. That second role, to pray for that person. And the outcome, James says, is so that they may be healed. And how does that work out? As, you, as a person listens to that confession, they could remind that person, you're not alone. You're not the only sinner on planet earth. The person listening is one too. And that person could point that one, the one who confesses to Jesus, to his love, his grace, his death on the cross. This promise of acceptance and, and, and this belief that we are in God's family forever, that you're not going to be kicked out of the family because you've messed up once or twice or a zillion times, but that, his, that the blood of Christ covers that sin. It's a powerful word that we can be given. It's not just someone like me who's a pastor or a priest who can give those words. It's what the reformers in the, in the 16th century called the priesthood of all believers. All of us as brothers and sisters in Christ can offer that to one another. The reminder that in Christ we are forgiven. That God doesn't count those sins against us anymore. And we all need to hear that good news. So what does this require? Like all love, love requires sacrifice. It requires giving up something for the sake of the other, for the sake of the relationship. So what's the sacrifice that has to be made? For the person who is confessing, it requires giving up the mask, of sacrificing that mask, taking it off, and being real with someone, saying, here's where I'm struggling. 
here's where I've messed up. Here's where I am messing up. And I fear I will continue to mess up, to take off that mask. With that sacrifice is you're giving up pride. You're giving up control. And you're giving up that relationship the way it was. And it's a step of faith, a step of faith to entrust yourself to another person. It's a big step. It can be a scary step if there's not someone there to catch you when you take that step. So what does the other person have to sacrifice, the person who listens? That person has to sacrifice the right to judge. If someone comes to you and says, I've, I've sinned. Here's where I've sinned against God. I need to share this with you. I need someone to know. I need help. Will you pray with me that that, that person will suspend and hold off on judgment and at that point, first and foremost, provide grace, provide a listening ear, provide love, provide a hug, and provide a prayer that, and provide them Jesus to point them to the promise of Christ for them. Yeah, where they need help, truth will come, but first lead with grace and sacrifice first judgment. So what does this mean for me? And as I can recall in my life, I mean, when I became, first became a Christian for real as a freshman in high school, I remember thinking a lot of the times, maybe it's my half Chinese Asian guilt or what, but I felt confessing was something I always did because I knew I always felt like I was messing up. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I could actually tell someone, God, that I messed up and wasn't going to get yelled at. It was a wonderful, wonderful fountain of living water to be able to confess and get off my chest, God, here's where I've sinned. And to know that he still loved me, accepted me, and was going to help me move through it. But I was too scared to tell anyone else. What would other people think of me? I mean, in my youth group in high school, what would they think of me if they really knew this about me? You know, would they still let me even come on Sunday nights? I mean, there was lots of thoughts coming through my head. And it wasn't actually until college. I still remember I was driving home after my sophomore year in college and coming up Interstate 81, driving up towards my parents where they moved in New Hampshire. And one of my closest friends, Matt, he was doing an internship. I still remember the town, Foglesville, Pennsylvania, wherever that is. And I remember that uh, he had said, hey, look, why don't you stop and let's hang out. And, and so I stopped and to see Matt. And, and whatever was happening in my life, I felt like I needed to share with someone my struggles and my sin. And I knew Matt because of our experience in our college Christian fellowship that he'd be someone who was safe and someone who could handle it. I said, Matt, I got to tell you something. I got to share some of my struggles. Are you willing to listen? He said, absolutely. I'll never forget. I could picture the living room where I was sitting where I shared with him some of my struggles and my sin. And I confessed my sin to a brother in Christ. And I was scared. Even Matt. I mean, this guy was, I mean, he Deep inside, I, I, I knew, I felt I knew that he would receive a well. But like anyone else, you could have said, why'd you tell me that? Like, I don't want to be your friend. I, mean, I was scared. What was he going to do? My biggest nightmare was that he'd just walk out of the room. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. I remember him saying, Jeff, you know God loves you. You know Jesus died for your sins. He hasn't given up on you. In fact, this step of faith you've taken is exactly what he wants you to do. This doesn't change our friendship. I love you even more. And Matt prayed for me. I remember him laying his hand on my shoulder, praying for me. And I had never felt better in my life. That this friend received that confession, prayed for me. And you know what? Because I was open with him, then he was open with me. And he shared with me, and I prayed for him. You know, he was the best man in my wedding, I was the best man in his wedding. That bond was formed that day, because we were open to it. That's some of my stories, but as the years have gone on, let me tell you, it's not always easy, because it's so easy for me to slip back into image impression management, wanting to look good. I still struggle. I'm like, should I put anything on Facebook? Because am I trying to make myself look better? I mean, it's a struggle. It really is. Because I want to look good. And so what holds me back from doing it now? I know it's, I still hate messing up. I still hate being wrong. And I still easily beat myself up. 
And it's easier for me to put on a mask and hide than to be open with other people. It's way too easy to hide. But, but I know if there's a safe person who's willing to listen, if there's a safe person who recognizes that in Christ we are all on level ground, common ground together, if I can share and that person receives it and, 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 back, and vice versa, that there's an opportunity for freedom, as James says, for healing, and dare I say it with our church name, for restoration. It's available. It's there. But I have to recognize those barriers for me that I have to give up my mask, my pride, and my control if I want to move into that. And if someone else comes to me, though I've been available for other people, I have to realize if someone opens up their lives, their life to me, am I willing to give up the time and energy to walk alongside that person if they entrust that to me? I have to be open to that. And so my question to you is, similar questions to you, what does this mean for you today? My first question to you is, I'm really curious. I can't all answer it, but I ask it, and I want you to think about this in your heart and mind. To what extent have you actually thought about and practiced confession in your life? The reason I ask that question is, I've come to learn that I just assumed that that was always was the way of being of Christians. Again, I joke about being half Chinese. I think it's, it's in the blood. I know it's the nature of feeling shame and guilt and always wanting to confess. But it may not be part of your picture. I don't want to assume it is. And if perhaps today this is the first time you've really thought about this, to know that God invites you and asks you to come to him to confess and agree with the fact that you're not perfect, that you've sinned, and to sp specifically confess those sins to him. And that there's freedom in that. That God wants to grant you freedom and joy and to take that weight off of you. And he also invites you to share that with another person in, a, in an appropriate way. It's not like we're going to say amen and walk around and go share your deepest, darkest sins with every person you see in this room. But it's in the context of relationship. How can you move towards that? And so I ask you to consider what it means to confess your sins to someone else. Consider praying and asking God, who is that person? Is there someone in our church family that perhaps maybe you could say, I need to have a conversation with you. I need help. I need prayers. Are you willing to listen? And then to step out in faith and then entrust yourself to that person in terms of that confession. In the way of James 5.16, therefore, confess your sins to each other and then let the other person follow the second part of that command and pray for one another so that you may be healed. You know, take, a step of, take that step of faith. If you can't think of someone, then I invite you to consider to pursue relationships in our church through small groups, through other venues, to get to know people. And over time, look around and think and pray and say, maybe that's the person. Maybe if I said, can we grab a cup of coffee? Can we sit down? And I'd love to share something with you. And then on the flip side, for us, for you to be willing to listen to the confession of others. To, to love one another as Christ has loved us involves being willing to listen, to be present, to suspend judgment and to bring grace and to point others to Jesus. Not if, but when they've messed up, when they've sinned. And to be God's agent in that. So how can we do this in terms of loving one another? I encourage you and exhort you so let's seek to be real with one another. Right, all of us, let's seek to find at least one person with whom we can confess our sins. And lastly, let's seek to be that person, that listening ear for another person. The best way to find that person is to be that person for another. It's like all friendships. The best way to find friends is to be friend for another person um, and to trust God with, with the timing and way of that. I tell you, my bold prayer for our congregation continues to be, and I pray this daily, that every single one of us would have at least one person with whom we can take off the mask and truly be ourselves. And my prayer is that this message would be a reminder, starting from the beginning, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us have it together. None of us are perfect. And Jesus was sent to save you and for me from our sins. And because of that, we're on level ground. We're on common ground before Jesus and the cross. And because of that, my dream and prayer is that our church family would be a safe place 
that at least with one person, you could say brother or sister in Christ, because we're family. We're not just individual souls who happen to be worshiping in the same church. We are family, and family helps one another out and loves each other, and that that could be a marker of our church, because my nightmare is that all of us are just walking around with these massive backpacks on of guilt and shame, and it's even clipped in. We're walking around feeling like, I don't know who can help me. Or if I asked for help, that they wouldn't help me. What would it look like if we were known as a church that there is help? And that help is ultimately from God, and that help comes through one another as we put into practice James' words of therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Healed. So I want to give us some time for reflection and and personal confession here. I'm going to take a couple minutes of silence um, to let God just come alongside of you and and bring to mind a place that you can, something that you can bring to him, something you can confess. And I'm going to take a, a minute or so of silent reflection and confession for that. And then we're going to pray a prayer together. Some have wondered, why do we pray prayers of confession together? Right? Is this like high church liturgy? Are we the Catholic church? No. There's beauty. There's something beautiful when we together in one voice confess that we are all messed up and we need God's grace. If you're looking for some good news this morning, it sounds like bad news, but it is good news because God doesn't leave us there. And so that's why we pray these prayers of confession together. My prayer is that it would bring you a sense of renewed freedom and strength and joy, recognizing as we pray this prayer together that God will meet us through it. Um, Again, for some of you, this may not be something you've practiced your entire life, but it's something that God invites us to practice so we can let off, take off these burdens and give it to him. And so after we pray, the prayer confession will be done, and then we'll continue in worship with our offering, and the, the ushers will come forward and receive that offering. But first... Let's go to God in prayer for a time of silent reflection. Let's pray. Let's pray. God, hear our prayers. Lord, as we come to you now um, in silence, as we reflect on our lives and bring to you, Lord, uh, the sins that we need to confess to you, recognizing, God, that there is no surprise to you. But as we confess these to you, Lord, that you promise to forgive us, to heal us, to set us free and move us forward. 